Okay, in the interest of time, we, we do know your time is very precious. We will start today's webinar. Um, it's about the future in retirement. So thank you all so much for joining us. A very hot topic indeed. But before we get underway with the content of today's um, program, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the country on which we meet today and, and the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, waters and community. Uh, today I'm coming to you from the land of the Turrbal and Yagara people uh, in the land known as Mianjin, which is Brisbane. And I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So as the title suggests, we will examine our future in retirement. And uh, that future is uh, quite exciting depending on uh, what position you're going to take. And we've got some three very interesting speakers today with Tim, Angie and David. Um, the very first topic we're going to talk to is about the responses of funds. Uh, that we've received in terms of the, the impact of the retirement income covenant. Um, the presentation is going to consider two aspects, which are summarised in a paper that we'll be releasing at the end of today's webinar. First speaker today is Angie Hartle, um, a consulting actuary and retirement income specialist with over 25 years experience, both in Australia and the UK. Angie's going to provide an update on what the published retirement income strategy summaries on funds websites revealed. Um, uh, and then, of course, Tim Jenkins, who's very well known to you, is going to discuss where funds are going after the initial retirement income strategies are in place. Um, Tim's a partner at Mercer and a veteran. I hope you don't mind me calling you a veteran, Tim. <laughs> um, that's true. true. Sounds old, doesn't it? Um, in the superannuation industry. He has extensive experience in providing advice to superannuation funds and trustees, particularly on insurance and member outcome requirements. Tim is also chair of the Actuaries Institute of Superannuation and Investments Practice Committee. So after a Q&A session on the covenant, we're going to then pass to Dr. David Knox, who's going to lead a fireside chat, as only David can do, on what superannuation developments we can expect now that we've got the new Labor government in power. David's a senior partner at Mercer and senior actuary for Australia. The whole of Australia, David? Correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fantastic. He's also national leader for research and policy and has been the actuary to several public sector superannuation plans. Okay, so that's our speakers. That's the topics we're going to be talking about. A little bit of housekeeping. I think everybody's familiar with the way Zoom meetings work now that we're kind of three years in, but there's a, a chat function if you want to talk to us about maybe a sound problem that you're having or anything that's sort of not working for you or um, a clarity that you want around something. And then there's a Q&A box where you can type in your questions and they'll be released to the panel and then we'd be more than happy to answer them. If we can't get to them today, we will be recording the session, recording the questions, and we'll take some questions on notice if we can't get through them. Okay, I think I've covered everything that I need to. So without further ado, Angie, it's over to you. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, Anthony's driving the slides. So if I can just ask you to move on probably to the next one, please. Thank you. So what did the retirement income uh, strategy say? I'm gonna go through that, um, but I just thought it would be worthwhile spending a minute or two recapping on what was required by the retirement income covenant. Um, so the covenant was introduced and said that um, trustees must have a retirement income strategy in place to assist fund members who are, so it was a plan to set out how they're going to assist fund members who are retired or approaching retirement to achieve and balance the three objectives we can see here. So they were to maximise expected retirement income, manage those expected risks to the sustainability and stability of their expected retirement income, including longevity, investment and inflation risks. And thirdly, to balance having flexible access to expected funds during retirement. Next slide, please. So then it said in formulating the retirement income strategy that the CISAC requires trustees to take reasonable steps to gather the necessary information to record the strategy in writing and to record in the documented strategy with reasons. So each determination, and there were three of those. So the members covered by the strategy, the definition of retirement income and the period of retirement. 
So document all of that and any other significant decisions made with reasons and the steps taken to gather the information. And then importantly, that would form uh, the trustees retirement income strategy. Um, the trustees then had to publicly make available a summary of that strategy. So you don't necessarily have to publish the whole strategy on your website, but a summary had to be published by 1st of July. And that's what we're going to talk about now. What do the strategies actually say? Next slide, please. So we read them all. We read all the ones that we could find, which was 102 funds. So we had a lot of fun in store for us there. Um, they were really different. So they varied significantly in terms of size, detail, target audience, and messaging. Some funds chose to advertise their strategy on the homepage with a banner, where 86% uploaded a sec separate document. So their summary was uh, uploaded as a separate document uh, onto their website. It's very subjective, I know, but we found 26% of them easily. 34, so when we say easy, that was typically it would be on the homepage or would be a link on the homepage. 34% were difficult to find. They took a bit of work. Um, APRA have seen these statistics and said, you know, if, it's, if we're finding it hard, if it's hard to find, then that's not good enough and that, that needs to change. And 40% we sort of said were, you know, in, in the middle. So typically that meant that the strategies were uploaded to the governance or retirement section of the websites. They were so varied in length, so ranging from a one-page summary on, on, the, on the actual web page to a 22-page document was the, the longest document that we saw. And target audience, there was two different approaches. So the first approach was really to have this as a governance document for the fund. And this was actually consistent with our reading of the legislation and, and what was required. The other approach was more of a, a sales-based approach to members. Now, APRA have, since, since the strategies were issued, indicated that they believe that the, the document should indeed be a member-facing document because it's published on the website. Our suspicion is that, that is where the documents are at the moment is perhaps it doesn't quite meet what APRA is looking for, but we know that they are now going to do a sort of fairly thorough review of the strategy, so it'll be interesting to see what they say. Moving on to the next slide, please, where I'm gonna look at key determinations. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we didn't, you didn't have to publish your actual full strategy on the website, just a summary. So around half of the summaries published uh, included details of the key determinations that the trustees have made. So when I talk up to this slide, that's just looking at, at those that publish the determinations, so around half of them. So there's three determinations, as I mentioned earlier. So the first was what, which members are covered by the strategy. So most funds opted to, to, to include members that are age 50 and above. Uh, some went as low as age 45 and above, and a few had age 60 plus. But on average, or in fact, sorry, it's more than average, the majority went with age 50 plus. Now, definition of retirement income. So the under the covenant, the minimum definition of retirement income to be included in the strategy is um, the payment a beneficiary receives from the fund plus the age pension where eligible. So about 60% of the funds that chose to disclose their key determination opted for the definition of retirement, that's this minimum definition of retirement income. And their rationale was that they, you know, they didn't have any other information available to them as trustee of the fund. But that, of course, means that 40% of the funds were, were looking to include a higher definition of income. So they, uh, there was a, a range, but they mentioned things like super assets held with other funds, financial assets held outside of super, and a member's income outside of super, including spouse's income. So that does, of course, raise the question as to how funds will actually obtain this information unless there's going to be innovative changes. So, you know, for example, allowing members to authorize the ATO and Centrelink to share um, this financial data with their permission, presumably funds are relying on members providing that information to them. Now, the third determination was period of retirement. So most funds define period of retirement as being from preservation age or retirement or date of retirement to date of death. 
But about a third of funds did use a lower age than um, than that. So they used um, either age 60, and that was typically for the, the DB funds, um, where that was a specified normal retirement age. And there was a couple that used age 64 and age 65. And looking at the upper end of the period of retirement, under 20% of the funds that disclosed their determinations used something different to date of death. Um, so as it that included age 88, life expectancy, life expectancy plus five years, age 95, and a maximum age of 100. So a bit of a range there for 20% of the funds as to that upper period. Now, the covenant requires trustees to consider their fund members by cohorts when setting their retirement income strategy. And given the different retirement income needs of different members in retirement, this is especially important. Now, about a third of super funds indicated in their summary that they had divided their membership into cohorts, but only 8%, which is the 8% there, um, only 8% of super funds indicated that they then um, applied or planned to develop different strategies for different cohorts, other than to distinguish between pre and post retirement. So we only had a third that, that looked at dividing their funds into cohorts, and then only 8% that were actually going to look at different strategies for the different cohorts. Next slide, please. So moving on to financial advice now, a significant number of funds mentioned that individual financial advice to members was a core component of their strategy, as, as you would expect. But only half of the funds mentioned in their strategy summary that members would have access to financial advice through the fund. We would say, um, I would definitely think that calculators are a valuable tool for members as they plan and approach retirement. So two thirds of funds um, in their summary mentioned the use of retirement calculators. Noting that for, for that two thirds, we could, for 12% of them, we couldn't find calculators on the website. What does that mean the other third are doing? Does that mean they don't believe that calculators are important or is it just that they've not mentioned them in their strategy summary? Moving on to the next slide, please. So just moving on to products. So there, of all the 102 funds we, we read their strategies for, most of them um, indicated that members would have access to an account-based pension, which is probably what you would expect. There was 8% that didn't, but they were just the, the really small funds. 55% also indicated their super fund offers a transition to retirement option. Now, in contrast, and again, probably not a great surprise, but only 13 super funds provide access to a lifetime pension. That does increase to 17 if you include closed defined benefit funds. But if we think about those 13, 11 of those 13 offer an annuity. One offer the choice of a fixed income for either, fixed, uh, for either life or a fixed term. And one has a lifetime pension with some money back protection in the event of the member's early death. Now, the covenant requires trustees to focus on the diverse needs of their funds membership in retirement, and we expect to see greater innovation in retirement offerings over the next few years. Now, as you know, the initial retirement income strategy is really only the first step in a journey. APRA expect trustees to continue to refine and update their strategies over time. Now, we did have 57% of funds um, stating in their strategy document that they intend to review their retirement offering. Only five funds actually told us what they're going to do. So for those five, they said they would include lifetime and fixed term income products and also enhanced account based pension products. So providing preset drawdown and reallocation strategies. Now we have met with a number of providers in the last few months that are coming out with very innovative solutions that are hoping to launch in the market shortly. And they're particularly focused on the longevity concern. And I understand that particularly one of them has partnered with a few industry funds. So we definitely expect to see more innovation in the market, which will be fantastic. Uh, lastly, six funds documented their intent to conduct sort of more research. So more specific additional member research to better understand the member needs and gather member data on home ownership, marital status, and assets held outside super. 
So that really, in a nutshell, is what the strategy said for these 102 funds. Um, it was fascinating reading, really interesting to see the diverse approaches, um, I think, in, in these documents. So where to next? I'm going to hand over to Tim now, who will talk about uh, what, what the next steps are. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Angie, for the update and hello, everybody. Well, one thing to focus on there, I think, as Angie said, um, every trustee met the deadline of 1 July. And remember, the legislation was only passed about four months before. So the trustees got a wriggle on. And I think to a large extent, that reflects the fact that trustees for many years have been looking at member retirement outcomes. They have been doing things, whether it's products, uh, account-based pension investment options, um, in some cases, a lifetime income products. Um, in other cases, they've been providing advice and guidance and help. Um, and really, the strategies articulate to a large extent what trustees have been doing. Um, so whilst all funds met the deadline, I think what it showed was that by looking at it in more detail, by looking at the strategy formulation in cohorts, I think most trustees started to realize there's probably more to be done. Uh, we're in a, a really good place, but we could be in a better place. So what I wanted to do now was just walk through firstly, what the regulators are up to now we've reached 1 July. I think that's quite important. What's APRA said, what's ASIC said. Um, and then from that, I'm going to go through the six areas on this slide here. This is the only slide I'm going to talk to. And I'm going to be going through thinking about what next, say, for example, on the product innovation. What next on how that integrates with member advice engagement? What do you need to do about the data management? How does this fit with the other strategies that you have? And then, of course, and Angie mentioned this one as well, um, you do need to monitor, you do need to review, how do I know I'm being successful? So that's where I'm going to head over the next a few minutes for you all. And at the end of that, Angie and I are going to open up for some Q&A to everyone um, on what's there. So start to think about the questions that you would like to ask. So the regulators um, prior to 1 July ASIC and APRA issued one letter one short letter in March which said here are a few hints how you should be um, looking at your covenant responsibilities um, and please please they said read the treasury explanatory memorandum which was 20 pages versus the one and a half pages of new legislation in the CIS Act giving you the guidance where to head. Um, that was interesting, um, but now APRA and ASIC are being more vocal about their expectations. What are, what are we going to expect from the regulators now we've reached 1 July and the summaries of the strategies are published? Well, the first thing that we've heard is that the regulators intend to do what they did with a member outcomes SPS 515. Um, they will be selecting a group of funds, probably 20, 25, and they'll be doing a deep dive asking for the strategy a formulation documents, looking at the summaries as well, how does that compare? And they'll be analyzing all of those and that will be happening later this calendar year. So, so that's ahead of us quite soon. And then in early 2023, the regulators will publish their observations and findings and hints to people about the way forward. So I think we can expect that as opposed to the route of an SPG or an SPS um, to give us the guidance um, about where to head. Um, so that's what's going to happen there. Um, and it really gives an opportunity, I'd say, that every trustee, whether or not you said you'd be reviewing your retirement income strategy in one year or three years, will want to look at this probably sooner rather than later to make sure you stay on the right side of the regulator for this. Okay, so product innovation. 
Um, and just to recap here, the final covenant as legislated moved away from the prescription that we first saw about two, three years beforehand with sippers and concepts like that. This is how your products must look, what you must do. It's a very much principles based. But of course, with the bit of hint behind the scenes that if you don't innovate, you can expect perhaps extra legislation down the track to encourage you to take certain actions to put certain products in place. So with the um, innovations, really they've, they're falling three different ways. So we've got innovations all based on account-based pensions, how to use them more intelligently. There's a real concern, for example, about people drawing down at the minimum rate, as opposed to thinking about where do I need to spend my money? Do I have an unintended bequest? Um, and then also product innovation coming in the form of a longevity protection products, and there's a myriad of those. Um, as Angie mentioned, whilst only a handful of trustees have longevity products in place today, and only an even smaller number said we intend to do these things as part of our strategy, perhaps implementing these, we do know behind the scenes that there is a lot happening. Insurers have been very active, investment managers have been very active in these areas, um, and we can expect from what we can see happening behind the scenes, um, a myriad of new products hitting us um, over the next couple of years. Um, some trustees are quite far advanced, although they haven't um, publicly announced those as they do the consumer testing and, and similar, not least because trustees are rightly concerned and product managers rightly concerned about legacy product, introducing things without thinking about distribution and making sure enough people take up the options that are provided. So if, if, if we consider those account-based pension type options, um, one of the ones that is becoming effective is the soft default option. So many members, as we were looking at the cohort analyses and trustees likewise, are, are in the accumulation phase when perhaps, you know what, they should actually be in retirement phase. They're over age 60, 65. They could be in a tax-free environment and they haven't moved. And some of that is because of the advice legislation and uh, not wanting to hawk, as it were, and um, come, come forward and put something forward. But on the member best financial interest basis, it, if you can help people move across, um, that's very effective. And soft defaults really help. They're saying, if you just tick the box here, we will move you to option X whilst you make your mind up what you're going to do. That can be very effective indeed. Um, the next type of option there uh, with account-based pensions is actually to help people choose which investment option or options they choose. The bucketing approaches, which several funds have had in place, um, and that can become much more sophisticated in terms of the drawdown percentages, um, how much you hold in cash for immediate liquidity needs, etc. cetera. Um, these nudges as they were, it really is the intersection between product and advice. So I don't think you can look at the two quite separately from each other, um, but we can expect um, more funds to have that to actually help their members. This is a really difficult area and the more funds can do, the better. Then as Angie mentioned, um, there's people looking at lifetime annuities, group securitized annuities, variable annuities, deferred annuities, uh, liability driven investments there's lots of different things going on to try and help solve the longevity issues um, so we can expect all these innovations to be popping through it doesn't mean they're all discrete and some funds will probably do a mixture of all three packages them through looking at different personas and cohorts and how these things might work so that's the major i wanted to talk through there about the product innovation and uh, again the warning if if it didn't happen uh, we can expect it to happen to us. I might not go into the same detail as member guidances and, and uh, advices I might otherwise have. We just had a 
very big report published yesterday. The quality of advice uh, proposals have popped out from uh, Michelle Levy has come through, um, and that's putting forward a very different model for the provision of advice and guidance for the future. Much easier for funds, really focusing on the quality of the advice provided at the end rather than the safe harbour rules, etc. statements of advice and how to get there. But regardless, even if those proposals are accepted, they're not going to come in for two, maybe three years at the soonest. There's a long journey and consultation and otherwise. So trustees are faced in, in this interim world of saying, well, I'm feeling a bit constrained about what I can and can't do under the Corporations Act. Um, what can I do with the anti-hawking rules, personal financial advice laws, what's general advice, what's personal? Oh, my God. Um, so a little bit constrained, but there are definitely things that trustees are looking at and probably should look at as part of enhancing the strategies that are in place. So, for example, um, information on topics that can really help people, putting in front of people, how can I move my savings to a tax-free position? Now I'm 65, say. The calculators, um, how they work, um, providing income pro projections on annual member benefit statements, and providing improved access to financial advice. I mean, Angie mentioned some numbers before there. I suspect virtually all funds are doing something, um, but often on a summaries, you forget to say the obvious. And I was saying to someone, that's how I remember my exams. You often forgot to say the really obvious thing and you lost your marks. Um, I think there's a bit of that going on in these areas. It was so obvious some people didn't put these in their summaries. Member engagement. This is a different lens on part of this. If, if you think of this from a trustee perspective, as well as having the strategy in place to help the members balance those three competing objectives. If, I, if I'm a fund, I want to attract members and I want to retain members. I'm looking at fund growth. Sustainability is key. So the a member experience and the customer journey become central to how all this works. Um, and funds are continually uplifting their member experience and the customer journey. Um, so you know, if you start to think about that and how you use that in a way to grow the fund and get better member retirement outcomes, the two of them can be a win-win. Um, if you start to analyze the cohorts and the behaviors and what's happening, you probably find that you need to win the hearts and minds of people in their 50s. That's when they start to consolidate. Um, and then you need to make the journey easy for them to go from I've got all my super with you to I've got all my retirement money with you. So that's where we see techniques um, and different strategies in play, whether it's a pension transfer bonus or other ways to make it easier for either the member or their advisor to say, actually, if you stay with your fund, that's a really good solution for you for your retirement income. So this is an area where people are really going to focus the customer journey, the digital, et cetera. So then on to the data management. This is something surprise, surprise, the cohorting showed that there is so little trustees actually know about members when it comes to the difficult decisions for retirement income. You know about the one individual. You don't know if they're partnered. Or you don't know if they've got a house. You can infer. You can look at people like them, but you don't know about where people actually sit themselves. Um, so the more data you hold, the more relevant the data, the better the solutions you can provide or the options for members to tailor your retirement strategy to be their own personal individual retirement income strategy. Um, so I'm sure funds will start to think about how do I fill the gaps in my data? Um, how do I collect and use the data that I have? How do I stay ahead of things? How can I infer? It's not just the data analytics, but it's 
the governance of the data and the management. Um, and you see with the APRA projects there, the super data transformation, what's being collected, there's more and more data there and it's richer and richer. And we can expect as that happens and you connect that in with a member outcomes SPS 515, that we're going to end up in an area where gradually trustees know more about their members um, and the promoters of the fund likewise. But I think there's quite a journey to be had and that will increment and be continuous improvement. So second last, just overlaying those broader strategies. Uh, retirement income strategy is only one strategy for the fund. You've got your investment management strategy, you've got your member outcome strategy in particular. Um, we can expect, or you should really be thinking about overlaying the broader strategies. How do they all interconnect with each other? Uh, we've heard ASIC mention that they're going to be focusing on how does the retirement income strategy link with the design and distribution obligations? APRA many times has been talking SPS 515. How does this work in the framework? If you've looked at the consultation paper out on SPS 515, there's three or four questions there about retirement income strategies and how they should link and how these all come together. Um, but ultimately, when you link them together and you're business strategy overall, it will be how are you as a fund positioned to retain members who are approaching retirement and then deliver for them in retirement? And really, what changes do you need to make to compete with funds out there from what you can see they're up to? Um, do you need to have a more comprehensive suite of retirement income solutions? Are you happy with what you've got? Is it about how you communicate them? It's how you link them all together. So I think that will be a focus for everybody. And then lastly, monitoring and review. The KPIs that you have, how do I know if my retirement income strategy is a success? How, how are members using this as opposed to me and my strategy that I've put there to help them use this? How do I link this to my business performance review? Um, do I have the right KPIs? And am I really focused on retirement outcomes for the member as opposed to a good outcome for the fund? Hopefully they're the same thing, but they don't necessarily have to be. So to summarize, um, whilst the covenants now in place and the strategies are, are published, I'd say we're very much still at the starting point rather than the destination when it comes to retirement income strategies that truly make a difference to fund members. So with that, I'll pass back to Anthony and um, I think we're gonna open up for some Q&A. Excellent, thanks, Tim. Welcome back, Angie. Okay, um, I have one question here from Jonathan. Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Um, great presentation, thank you. Is there actual evidence on the longevity risk? Who's going to grab that? I might start, and Angie, you come in when I fail miserably to answer <laughs> it, perhaps, on there. Um, I, well, it, I, I'm an actuary, and you, you look at these things, and there is a real issue when you have passed all the retirement risks to the individual as compared to the old days where anyone had a defined benefit pension, if you go back many, many years. So you're now in a situation where you have a pot of money and you need to work out what to do with it. And there are all these things you don't know. It's so complex how this all fits together, the age pension, um, what you have, your account balance, how quickly you spend it down, whether you have a partner or don't have a partner, or if that changes in retirement, what happens to your house? Can you draw down money with a reverse mortgage? But one of the biggest things of all is how long am I going to live and how long is my partner going to live? I, big unknowns. And if you start to have too big a margin in that, you have an unintended bequest. So it does make sense if you start to think of this from a theoretic perspective that I should try and get someone else to help me with that, which is why you try and say, if I can purchase a deferred pension, say, or um, an immediate annuity to help with the component of that, remembering that the age pension does that as well. That is a great longevity risk protector for everybody. 
So I think to Jonathan's question there that it's a real risk for everybody. You can be absolutely certain that only one person out of 100 will live the average length. If you look at those, the 50%, most people will get it wrong. And it's, it's, it's people not having a clue how long they're going to live that's stopping them withdrawing their account-based pension, right? That was why we had the, partly why we had the review in the first place, I, I, that, that people were scared to withdraw their money more than the, the minimum amount because they were worried about not having enough to live on. So I think it absolutely is a, is a risk. And David, I'm sure you've got something to say. You've been studying this for years. <laughs> I was going to chip in anyway, Tim. Uh, it is interesting. And in terms of longevity, I'd make a couple of points. When people retire, let's say in their 60s, most people underestimate their life expectancy. They don't think they're going to reach 90. Let's put it that way. But by the time they get to 85, they overestimate their life expectancy. I have already got to 85. I'm going to get to 100. Um, which is, of course, not, not the case for everybody. Um, so there are perceptions and perspectives that vary. The other thing that I think funds have to be very much aware of is, um, and some of you will have uh, noticed, I've written re recently on unisex annuities and longevity is in part determined by our gender or sex. But in fact, it's our socioeconomic class that is even stronger. Now, we're not going to price annuities based on your socioeconomic class. That's just not appropriate. Um, but I think funds need to bear that in mind, that our life expectancy, yes, it's partly determined by genetics, but it's more, more determined by our lifestyle, um, the education we've had, our access to health services, what we can afford, um, et cetera. So funds need to bear that in mind as they think about longevity. And as Tim has said, for many Australians, the age pension is a great longevity product. Excellent. Shall we move on to our next question? Terrific. Um, Naomi uh, asks, and the, yes, the next yes, question David. I'm going to touch on, the one from okay. Naomi, um, yep. I'll start in my response. So, Okay, so will we pause, will we hold that one? I think we can hold yeah. that one. Fantastic. Okay. And Tim might want you to come back, but I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim and Angie, I'm assuming you can see the questions that I can see mm -hmm. that I'm scrolling through. So um, I'm going to I'm going to go to you, Tim, with uh, Mark's question around how do we see funds developing appropriate measures to monitor and truly understand the value of retention? Is this an opportunity for groups like Mercer to better define the data requirements? Um, Hello, Mark. Thanks for asking that question there. And it's a beautiful question to ask me because you're asking, well, what would I do at Mercer? So thank you on that. Um, I think one of the things here is actually to start to understand the a value of a member to a fund. Some funds and trustees have started to do models which say if I acquire a member at age X and Y happens, what is that worth to me as the fund in terms of outputs? So you're looking at from the fund perspective. So it's that's quite a useful tool because if you start to do that, it enables you to think about the expenditure that you have, which goes right back to SPS 515 expenditure management. Is it worthwhile doing initiative X if this is the outcome? What does it mean for my member? Um, so that's one part of this. And then if you expand from that, everything now is about metrics. So what do I understand? Um, when do people put their pools of superannuation money in different funds together? How do you start then to put a metric on that? So as you get the data from internally, your data analytics teams, for example, um, those are the sorts of things you need to ask to say, is my retirement income strategy effective? from a retention perspective. Um, are people staying longer than they used to? What's, what's that looking like? You start to get a longitudinal series the more you start to look at the different data. So perhaps that's the quick answer. Happy to come back, Mark, with right. more later. Now, I know we're, we're, um, we're tight on time, but um, team, shall we just do a couple more just to... Maybe sure one more, because I think David's got some really interesting things to go through, and I'd love yeah. us to share. And then we can come back to... Um, Okay, so uh, take your pick, um, team, um, Adam or Ravinda's question. They're both good I'll, ones. I'll pass to Angie. What would you like to answer? 
Um, I, there was, Adam raised a question about advisors. I was actually going to back that back to, mm. to the pair of you because I think, David, you were going to give some insights into the... I'll, I'll, the I'll advice pick up um, personal advice and general advice in a moment. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we, David, why don't you um, cover the areas you want to cover and then we'll see what's, uh, whether the, the, they answer the questions we've got and then we'll come back to the questions. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to concentrate on future developments and where we see the industry going. Um, as the gov new government has said, well, they've said the 12% wars are over. We're going to get to 12% SG. Uh, that is true, but there's still a lot of debate and there are th still things that are going to develop and emerge. And I'm going to mention three in particular. The first one, and Tim's already mentioned the quality of advice review consultation paper came out yesterday. Make a few comments on that. This is a paper that is primarily written by Michelle Levy, the consultant leading the review. It is not a treasury paper. It is not a government paper. In fact, it's so personal that Michelle on occasions within the paper has said things like, I think, in my view, or my answer to this question is dot, dot, dot. So she's very much expressing her perspective. Obviously, she has a secretariat of treasury officials who are working with her, um, but this is not a government paper. It is also not a review that was initiated by the current government, it was initiated by the previous government. So the Labor government has said, we're going to wait for the review and see what comes out of it. We're not committing to accept it or otherwise. So I think that's important. Having said that, I think Michelle has put in this consultation paper some very important stakes in the ground, if you like. The first thing is her goal and purpose is to improve the affordability and accessibility of financial advice. In other words, make it available more easily to all Australians. Not only in super, but outside super. There are two other things that I think are important stakes in the ground. One is that she's very keen on the fact that we should be looking for good advice. Is the advice good in the context and is the content of the advice good? It is not about process. It is about good advice. Now, how you measure that, of course, is another question. But what she, I think she's trying to do is simplify the process and not just make it tick a box and here's a PDS or here's a statement of advice, but was the advice appropriate? Did it improve the individual's financial understanding and situation? The second stake in the ground, I think, although it's not that clear in the consultation paper, because I think they ran out of, ran out of time and they did promise to uh, have this available by the end of August, they met that deadline by a day, but that all financial providers should have the opportunity to provide advice about their products. Whether you're a super fund or an insurer or a bank, you should have a advice, you should have opportunity to provide financial advice to your clients and customers about your products. Now that does raise the question that Naomi opened, asked, does this bring the banks back into financial advice? And I think the answer is to an extent, yes, it does. But the advisor has to take into account what they have been told or what they know about the individual. So Superfund knows so much, but not that much more. Bank may know other things, but at this point, the provider only provides advice about their products, unless you go into a comprehensive financial advice, which is a bigger story. Michelle's also suggesting that we remove the distinction between personal advice and general advice. That's a simplification. And that if we're talking about the general context, that is information, that is education. But as soon as we allow for your personal situation or what you've told us, that's personal advice. 
Now, what does it mean for a super fund? I think there are two important developments that Michelle has suggested. One, super funds can provide advice about things like transitioning into retirement, about retirement, about the products they have available, and how that advice is paid for is up to the fund. It's at the discretion of the fund. She's not specifying how the fee should be paid. So she's agnostic, if you like, about the channel the device is given, whether it's uh, through um, bots or whether it's face-to-face -face or whether it's through video or whatever. And she's agnostic about the fees that are paid. So lots of questions to be answered, but I think what she's trying to do is to simplify the landscape and to make it simpler for providers to provide advice that is good. Don't just go through box ticking. Obviously, what is good advice will be debated. As Tim said, we're on a bit of a journey here. Uh, what will the government response be? This is a consultation paper. It's got the potential to be a revolution in my view and a good one, but it's going to take time. So for the next two or three years, we are living within the current context in the current legislation. The second thing I want to mention today about government developments is the review of your future, your super. Tomorrow we get the second round of the My Super performance tests. Immediately after that, maybe later this week or early next week, a consultation paper will be released by Treasury about the review of your future, your super. We will have opportunities for about three to four weeks to respond to that. And that review will take into account stapling, will take into account the ATO comparison tool, uh, the performance tests, as well as the best financial interest duties. So it's a review of all the components of your future, your super, and the unintended consequences. Now, in my view, the government is committed to the continuation of performance tests for both my super and trustee directed products. But there are unintended consequences. We are seeing funds investment strategy and the like change the way they, um, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing consequences. Are they good ones? We could have a debate about that, but we haven't got the time. But I think we'll see the government commit to tests but I expect to see some tweaks in the tests and particularly in respect of trustee directed products. Just what that looks like, of course, only time will tell, but the government has already issued uh, regulations in respect of faith-based products. So I would like to think there is opportunity uh, for us to make those performance tests better, more credible and more appropriate. The third thing I want to mention before we turn to further questions is in respect of the objectives of superannuation. The government has committed that they will legislate the objectives of superannuation. Now, it's interesting that that is not the objectives of the retirement income system. That's a bigger question. Um, unfortunately, I think the government is going to commit it to superannuation. We had an objective a few years ago that wasn't passed by parliament. My understanding is the government will press ahead with this. They may be a little bit, or maybe less precious about the actual wording. It'll still be pretty general, it may even still involve the age pension, but I think they're committed to getting an objective of superannuation in place, even if it's not an objective of the broader system. So in terms of what the uh, government will, uh, new Labor government will deliver, I think we'll see a reform in financial advice, but it's too early to say what that will look like. Although I think Michelle Levy has indicated some very um, good direction, but we'll, um, there'll no doubt be a lot more discussion around that. I think we'll see reform to some extent in your future, your super. Again, uh, it may be tweaks at the edges, but that might be a good thing and we'll see the objectives of superannuation legislated. 
Anthony, I'll leave it at that and um, we can come back for more questions. Fantastic. Okay, I think you've probably covered Adam's question around the landscape for advisors in both personal and general. Um, I don't think there's anything else you wanted to cover. I think you've... I think that's... Yeah, thanks very much for that. And uh, Ravinda's asked a question around looking at member outcomes. Um, when you look at member outcomes currently measured, we mainly look at retirement balances, fees and investment performance, and they are good for accumulation phase. What are some suitable member outcomes we should be measuring in retirement phase? I'll take this one, if Lovely. I may. Um, retirement readiness index is a way I might respond to that. So it's not about what your account balance is, but what am I likely to be able to have as my retirement income based on my balance, my age, my gender, my partner status? Um, how likely is it as I approach retirement, I'm green for retirement readiness? Um, and I think funds are starting to look at that and actually look at the improvement in the metric as a percentage of my membership, how many people are in um, green, as it were, on that. So that, that's one way. Um, it is a very different world. And uh, APRA has asked some of those questions in its SPS 515 paper as well. They put it back on the industry to put forward, how do you think we should be doing this? Right. I wonder if we'll also see pressure on sort of fees as we do, uh, you know, we, we have, we, it's very clear now what, what fees are charged in the accumulation phase, as, as was as, uh, asked in the question, um, but we don't see any comparison of fees in the retirement phase. Um, so I, I wonder whether there'll be more transparency about that in the in the retirement phase going forward. I know we've just just done an assignment for a, a client and you, you you look at it and it's very hard to compare because they are expressed in such different ways. So it'd be interesting to see whether that's something that will be focused on by APRA going forward as well. I think that that's right, Angie, and fees in the retirement phase, even around the world, are incredibly difficult to measure because you know, if you just take a lifetime annuity, what's the fee in a lifetime annuity? Uh, it's implicit, it's not explicit for reasons I think actors at any rate will understand. Um, but it, it, it's very difficult to, uh, to compare. I, I think the other example we've got is if we look at around the world, we see a number of countries wrestling with this issue of how do you convert a pension pot, a lump sum at retirement into the best retirement outcome. And in my view, no one solved it. Um, and we're looking at it in the Global Index report later this year. Um, just a bit of a, an ad when we launch the um, Global Index report um, in October, we're going to have a member of the panel for the Pacific launch for the world, from the World Economic Forum, uh, their longevity expert. Um, so I think the rest of the world is looking at this issue. There's not a simple, simple answer as we know. Um, but it is a balance between those three issues that are part of the covenant of what we're trying to deliver, regular income, but uh, access to capital, et cetera. Excellent. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you, David, for that. Um, I'm going to just put a, put a question out to the panel, really, having just listened to this uh, presentation and the questions from our clients and friends out there. Um, what, what is the next thing that a super fund should do, like given all of these, all of this content that we've been discussing today, what would be the first thing that they could possibly do next to ensure success? Well, hopefully, Anthony, I outlined a few of those things. I don't think it's one thing. I think you need to think holistically. So I'd be saying you need to think of your retirement income strategy and then how do you now link this to your other strategies and objectives? Mm -hmm. Um, what does that mean for the strategic initiatives I give priority to for 2023? And of course, how do I stay out of the crosshairs of the regulators? <laughs> and you start to compare to other people's summaries and similar. Yep, right. I think that's a great first. Thing. Anthony, the other thing I would add is we know that people in retirement um, are not the same. There's great heterogeneity in retirement. And as a fund develops their strategy, as Tim has outlined, there may be some members that funds for commercial regions don't respond to because there's a very small cohort 
of a few percent or a couple of percent, and we say, well, it's not worth our while responding to that because that will develop a new product costs, et cetera. So we need to think about keeping our overall costs down as well as retaining members. So there's a, a commercial decision as part of that strategy as well. Excellent. Now, um, before we run out of time, we do have one more question, which I'm going to, um, which I'm going to mention, but I do want to show our clients the um, paper that has, is being released today. Um, there it is there. And I'm just sending in the chat a link there sent to everybody. So you can click on that link and you can open that paper live real time. And um, I just wanted to get that that done before we jump to Ross Butler's question. So if um, the panel can see Ross, I, I can see that I can answer. I'm going to get you to, to do that, yeah. Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, APRA and ASIC have announced that they will be doing an audit of the retirement income strategies and their formulation. They'll go into 2025 funds. They're going to publish their findings in early 2023 to everybody. That will be a public document. Uh, so, so, Ross, that's where you hear directly more formally from the regulator, though I'm sure if you're one of the funds that they've been um, looking at and supervising, you'll find out earlier what they thought of yours. <laughs> I think it's also interesting that APRA has said recently they're not giving specific advice, but they do expect new products. Yeah. So we're not going to tell you what to do, but you've got to do it. And to some extent, that's understandable because each fund has different membership and different needs and, and so forth. Um, but I also thought it was interesting that Jim Chalmers, the treasurer the other day, uh, mentioned the lack of appetite for a time and income products. So the government is actually expecting the industry to develop products. And if we as an industry don't do that, um, the government might actually tell us a bit more. Absolutely. But I think from what we see behind the scenes, I don't think they need to fear. I think that's right, Tim. Yeah. But it is interesting that the government uh, is interested. One more question. Can we? I think we can squeeze it in. Um, what do you expect APRA's view of retirement income strategies revealed? Um, what type of areas do you think it will focus on, changes we could expect to implement as a consequence? Do you want to take that, Angie? Um, yeah, happy to. Um, I think it will, it, will, it will reveal a lot of what we've just discussed today. I mean, we really have kind of been through these papers and, and given it some thought. I think, it's, I think it will push more on the products, on the fact that there really are not many funds at this stage committing to introduce new products, as we've just said. Um, there was only five that talked to any changes that they would make. And I think, so I think, I think they'll very much focus on, on products and also um, on understanding members better. So making the, make, making the document more targeted to members, um, but getting more information to understand the members, to develop products that are more targeted to the members, perhaps more specific um, cohorting. We only saw 8% of funds that um, actually said, we're going to cohort on members and apply different strategies to those, those cohorts. So that would be um, my view. I don't know, Tim, if you've got anything to, to add to that. In interest of time, I probably won't. We've hit the hour, so I might just leave it with what you've said. Right. Thank you. Look, thank you all very much for your attendance, your questions, and for the nice words of support and encouragement about how much you've enjoyed the session. So that's very much appreciated. Have a great rest of your week, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks. Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye.